Have you ever thought, why is something as American as apple pie? I'm asking. I think about pie a lot. Um, well, I mean, as someone who doesn't like the taste of apples, I've often considered why apple pie gets top national billing. I mean, take for example, peach pie. George is literally nicknamed the peach state, yet we supersede apples over peaches. It's very confusing. Well, regardless of the roots of why apple pie is the most American confection, I think that it's actually illustrative of something that I've been thinking about for a while, which is how do we assign qualities of national identity onto objects and thoughts, and what do those say about us in return? Well, if you're looking for the apple pie of the art world, look no further than this man right here. This is Norman Rockwell, an American illustrator whose career spanned most of the 20th century. Now Rockwell, like apple pie, is a great case study for how we impart ideas of national identity onto certain images through the use of Americana. And by Americana, I mean any kind of artistic medium that envelops itself in this sense of national identity. Uh, so Norman Rockwell was born in Brooklyn in 1894. Um, and grew up for most of his childhood in New York. Um, and he exhibited a talent for drawing by an early age, oftentimes recreating the images shown on his father's American Fleet cigarette cards. And despite growing up in a city that was bustling with museums and art galleries, he drew most of his inspiration uh, from you know, all of these illustrations and magazines that he had around. So in that sense, it's interesting. Um, and eventually his family would move out into the suburbs from New York, but he would return back to New York for his artistic training after dropping out of high school his junior year. And one of his first jobs after leaving the Art Students League of New York was as an illustrator for Boys Life magazine, a publication of the Boy Scouts. Now commercial art would continue to be Norman Rockwell's bread and butter, and I mean that quite literally in the sense that it put bread on the table because of a steady paycheck, um, during a time at which a lot of New York-based artists kind of shunned commercial work as beneath them. And over the course of his career, Norman Rockwell would create images and advertisements for brands like Jell-O, Listerine, and obviously Coca-Cola, oftentimes using a sense of nostalgia in the past to connect that to the product he was selling and to you know, the viewer in return. Um, now, mass media was in its infancy at the beginning of Rockwell's career, but it's really a wave that he helped build in the sense that you know, he was a primary image creator of that time period. Now, Yankelvich, a market research firm, estimates that we see upwards of 5,000 ads per day, whether it's on our cell phones, online, on the subway, whatever. Now, this kind of image inundation wouldn't have been around at the time of Norman Rockwell's career, because the primary modes of mass communication would have been radio and magazines, very different kinds of means of communication. But at the same time, this just makes Norman Rockwell all the more central, because he's creating this wave as one of the foremost illustrators of that time period. Now, Norman Rockwell, over the course of his career, would uh, paint 321 covers of the Saturday Evening Post. And this is major, because the Post allowed him a gateway into the gaze of the American audience and allowed him to ingrain himself in the cultural consciousness of the United States. And the Post, you know, while leading to his amazing success as an image maker, also ranked him as less than in the New York art scene, which, you know, was very different at the time. In her uh, biography of Norman Rockwell, art critic Deborah Solomon says that he was demonized by a generation of art critics who not only saw him as an enemy to modern art, but to all art. So his work definitely ran countercurrent to the abstract expressionists of the time, who were personified by Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock. So at this point, you're all wondering, what exactly does Norman Rockwell have to do with apple pie? And I would answer, they're both inherently American, or I see them as both inherently American, and I'm curious as to why that is. Now, Norman Rockwell, this is one of his most you know, well-enduring and most famous paintings, and it's called The Four Freedoms. Inspired by uh, FDR's State of the Union address, um, they depict uh, four universal freedoms that FDR was talking about to explain the US military involvement in the Pacific and European theaters. The freedom from want, the freedom from fear, the freedom of speech, and the freedom to worship. Now these are four universal human rights, but they also sound inherently American. So where Rockwell's success is, is he's inspired and takes these four freedoms from FDR's speech and transplants them into four covers from uh, the Saturday Evening Post that all appear in uh, 1943, two years later. Um, and now why these are successful and immensely popular are because he's taking these lofty you know, ideas that FDR is speaking about in his speech and making them accessible. He's making geopolitics accessible to the everyday viewer by depicting an idyllic and accessible reality. 
He's showing concerned parents. He's showing concerned families. Um, you know, people praying. Um, a happy Thanksgiving, which, if anyone's been to my house for Thanksgiving, is slightly unrealistic. But he's showing these in a way that is accessible for the American viewer. And I mean, these, uh, these covers were immensely popular. The Post received over 25,000 requests for reprinting. Um, and eventually what would happen is these four covers would travel from sea to shining sea as part of a joint exhibition between the US Department of the Treasury and the Saturday Evening Post. So they're going from coast to coast, and over the course of their exhibition, uh, they raise $133 million through the sale of postage stamps and war bonds. Now at this point, you're saying, OK, this is apple pie. This is the mainstream American narrative. It's in part the US government and part Rockwell's that he's creating, right? This is not apple pie. This is a very different sense. Perhaps this doesn't jive with what you've come to think about from Rockwell as an American narrator. Perhaps this doesn't you know, fit in with the subject matter that you've come to expect from him. But at the same time, let's realize that the increased social activism of the 1960s was actually an amazing canvas for Norman Rockwell to change the singular American narration that he had started with. So yes, the subject matter looks different, but stick with me, and we'll see that it's actually quite fitting coming from him. So after 47 years at Saturday Evening Post, Norman Rockwell left um, to become the main illustrator for the more socially progressive Look magazine. So what uh, Look magazine offered was an amazing opportunity for Rockwell to paint subject matter that was closer to his heart, you know, especially with the rising civil rights movement. So this painting is from 1964 and depicts the 1960 um, integration of schools in New Orleans. So this is six-year-old Ruby Bridges. She's going into William J. France Elementary School, not accompanied by her parents, but accompanied by armed US marshals. So obviously not an idealized version of American history. And this represents a major departure for Rockwell because we're moving not only from a primarily all white cast of characters to one that includes people of color as historical agents and agents of change, but also one that moves away from an idealized version of rural life to one that includes urban you know, realities of the day. So that's why the 1960s are important to consider with Rockwell's narration of American culture, because this uh, a period of immense social change allows him an opportunity to revisit and revise his you know, primary mode of American narration. So this is why Norman Rockwell matters, because he brings us from FDR to Kennedy. He brings us from our battles at Normandy to our battles for civil rights. And he brings us from a homogenous and safe United States to a challenging and complex America. Now, Rockwell's narration of the United States is probably not perfect. I think we can all agree on that. But it is something that we should consider when looking at the American 20th century. So from our coffee tables to our newsstands, um, Norman Rockwell did narrate the American 20th century. And Roland Barthes reminds us that mythology, you know, no matter its mistakes, is going to have a part in creating the world. So look around you. American mythology is all around us. And Norman Rockwell helped create that. He's helped establish that. Because we have this nostalgic connection to these images that were being shown. And you know, from now on, this isn't just about Norman Rockwell. This is about all kinds of images that we're seeing today. So whether it's Apple Pie or Appomattox, whether it's you know, Malcolm X or Mickey Mouse, I want you to think critically of what you've been taught and conditioned to think of as inherently American. And when we're seeing these images, you know, stop and take a second to process. What point of view is being put forth here? How does this make me feel? Do I agree with this? Do I not? In today's image-driven society, you know, we have to consider if Norman Rockwell narrated the 20th century, who will narrate the 21st? What stories will we give voice to? What perspectives will we listen to? And you know, who's going to narrate this immense time of change that we're uh, engaging with right now? So with that, I would just leave you with, you know, I don't have all these answers, but I hope that you can, you know, start to think about this. Um, and always remember that there is a power in being seen, and there is a power in being apple pie. Thank you.